The Blue Bloods are finally back to bring you guys another loaded episode full of college football news and content for, for your Monday. We start the episode by talking about which school deserves the title of Offensive Line University, and then we debate which franchises were the biggest winners and or and or biggest losers of this weekend's NFL draft. We then discuss the biggest storylines of the 2020 NFL draft, and we wrap it all up by giving our take on which players should have returned to school for one more year instead of declaring for the NFL draft. It's about that time, so let's kick it off. As we covered in recent episodes, ESPN dropped their rankings for position U for every school for every position since the BCS era. We are continuing our segment on this. We've already done quarterback, running back, wide receiver. Um, so we're going to go to offensive line, one of the more overlooked positions for casual fans, for experts, probably one of the more important positions, I would say. Um, ESPN ranked Alabama as offensive line U followed by Wisconsin, Oklahoma, Michigan, and Ohio State. And so just to reiterate the rules for new listeners out there, people who might not have caught up to our episode yet, we can only take into account O-Lyman from 1999 until this year in evaluating players. So, Brandon, which school did you deem O-Line you, and why did you pick this school? Look, and it's not that I don't think that Alabama uh, deserves this title of O-Line U. Um, they're definitely a qualified candidate. You know, you, you look at it year in and year out and you see, hey, you know, the magnitude of the quarterbacks they're bringing in besides Tua, who's the last great quarterback that Alabama had? I mean, Jalen Hurts, maybe before that, a bunch of nobodies. Um, but that's not my school. My school is actually um, and it's going to come to a shock. Uh, it's going to come as a shock to nobody here, because when I was preparing for this episode, I started to realize something. Um, that I may just be an undercover Wisconsin fan. So I've got Wisconsin as my O-line U here. And uh, I mean, do you really need me to name off the names? I mean, we have Joe Thomas, number one, uh, just retired from the 49ers this past weekend, or not even this past weekend. uh, I think it was on Thursday uh, when they were during the draft. Very very recent. Yeah. Um, Gabe Karimi. I I mean, players like Kevin Zietler, Travis Frederick, Michael Dieter. David Edwards, and the list goes on and on. Um, but not only these, but doesn't it just always seem like Wisconsin has a solid O-line? I, I mean, there has to be a reason that they're running back you. And yeah, their running backs are great, um, but the holes that are produced by this, uh, by this Wisconsin O-line just allows for these running backs to be so explosive in college. Uh, and, and there's got to be something going on in Wisconsin for these players to be just so massive, so so great at what they do. Um, and I think I figured it out. Beer and cheese. Wisconsin is known for these things, uh, and along with those, beer cheese. So these make for big boys hell. I mean, that's all I've consumed during quarantine, and I've gained like 20 pounds myself. So it doesn't matter if I'm lactose intolerant or if I have celiac disease. Absolutely not. It's delicious. I'm going to keep eating it, um, as should these guys, because that might just be what makes them O-line you. I like that theory. I like that theory. I mean – Beer cheese, I mean, you got to watch out there, guys. I mean, heart disease coming real hard at you. But, I mean, yeah. for me, I thought this was one of the easier choices. I feel like there were two top schools here, Wisconsin definitely being one of them. I had them at two for sure. Um, but I this, I think this is what the first time that one of us has – well, no, you agree with USC as quarterback you, but this is the first time I've agreed with ESPN here. I do have Alabama as the clear O-line you. I thought ESPN was going to totally screw this up. I'm glad they didn't. I mean, Brandon, so I'm just I'm going to list off some names for you. All right, okay. um, we got Jedrick Willis. I mean, it, he went pretty high. What Thursday night? Yeah. Uh, Jonah Williams, Ryan Kelly, Chance Warmack. Uh, we had Chance Warmack on our All Decade team. Uh, we have DJ Fluker, James Carpenter, Andre Smith, Chris Samuel. All of these were first round offensive linemen out of Alabama. Brandon, that is eight NFL first round picks off the O line from Alabama. And all these guys didn't play under Nick Saban. So this goes even further back than just since Nick Saban arrived. But, you know, eight offensive linemen drafted in the first round. That's the most out of any school uh, during this time period. And, that doesn't include the 13 other offensive linemen that were drafted sometime later in the draft, and that includes second-round picks like Cyrus Quanjo. 
who are still there. And Brandon, what's scary is if Alex Leatherwood doesn't come back to school to Bama for this next season, they would have had nine first round NFL offensive linemen taken because he would have went first round on Thursday night. I think we both agree Alex Leatherwood would have probably been the top offensive tackle taken if he would have come out. Um, and for me, I think Alabama consistently has one of the best offensive lines in the country. I mean, can you name a season where you looked at Alabama and said they had a weak offensive line? No. Uh, and, and like I said to preface this uh, this segment, uh, they've made their quarterbacks look like absolute stars, even if they're bums. Yeah, uh, I'll give you that. I mean, I think it's an interesting one. I mean, th- they – even before Saban, Bama seems to have these strong offensive linemen. For me, it's not a debate, really. I mean, Wisconsin is the closest team, I would say. But I think from top to bottom, Alabama has had better offensive linemen. And more consistently, they've had deeper offensive lines than Wisconsin. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to disagree with you there. I think that they're both very talented. Um, and like I said, I may be a secret Wisconsin fan. Who knows? Uh, I'm starting to think you're a secret Alabama fan, though, Zach. Care to defend yourself? I mean, this is the first time I've picked Alabama for anything, isn't it? Yeah, but you've been giving them a lot of credit lately. What's going on? And, and plus, you're a Miami fan. Now you've got Tua. What does that make you? Uh, I mean, okay, so I'll say this. I'm not happy about that pick. If you tuned in to our four-and-a-half-hour draft special Thursday, shout-out to you, one, for that, and two, I mean, I was – kind of upset with the pick i would have much rather had herbert or went o-line there or something like that but i understand i'm gonna root for tua for now but i I don't know i don't think i'm a secret alabama fan i mean we i would say this podcast overall gives alabama the hardest time out of any team in the country yeah it's fair enough i mean you came at them for what was it no okay so i did oh this is bad i might i actually i see your point because i did pick alabama for a receiver you see or no, no, it's, no, no, I did it. Okay, no, I did it. I, I lied. I picked Oklahoma State, but I had Alabama at two. Ah, man, yeah. you're calling me out here. See, it, it's, it just seems to me like you have Alabama right up there for, I mean, almost all of your university picks. I mean, yeah, they I, do. Got I, I, think, I think they're I think they're on your list for running back university. Uh, I know Georgia are. won it for you. Yeah, see, I mean, they're just yeah. up there. Because, I mean, if anyone's a secret Alabama fan, I think it might be you. Haven't you picked Alabama for wide receiver and and running back? Yeah, but see, I'm I'm not, you know, I'm an LSU fan. Yeah, I don't, I hate Alabama, but I think that your uh, hate for Alabama is just deep-rooted. I think that it's oh, like yeah, generational. Sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, neither, neither of my parents are Alabama fans. I, my whole family's Alabama fans, which I think that's why I hate Alabama so much. Um, if I had to go with a real reason, but... I mean, so even though I hate Alabama, I got to be for the podcast. I try to be as, you know, neutral as possible. And I, I got to give it to them, man. I mean, some of the names I listed, like DJ Fluker, Jedrick Willis, Jonah Williams. I mean, Chance Warmack, they could have came to Auburn. And guess what? I would have embraced it with open arms a thousand percent. I mean, I would take those players any day of the week because Auburn has had some offensive line troubles during this time period. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, but I want to ask you something. I mean, how surprised were you to not to, to you know, that Georgia was missing from this list? Yeah, you know, Georgia is one of those more notable um, schools when it comes to O-lines. I, I mean, you know, we, we definitely stressed the importance of their O-line this past season. Over the past, I mean, I'd say the past decade, they've just been a serious force, um, it, you know, as far as offensive lines are concerned. Uh, or, Ah, concerned. Sorry, I can't speak today. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I see your point there. I definitely think they should have been on the list. Should they have won this? No, not necessarily, but they should have definitely been up there. I mean, if, if I had to rank it, I'd probably have them, uh, shoot, probably maybe top five even. Yeah, I, I would probably have them top five. I mean, they also had five offensive linemen taken in the first round. I mean, Andrew Thomas went fourth on Thursday. I mean, and – down the, you know, looking forward, I see a few, many more Georgia players coming through the draft process. I mean, I would say even if you don't have them top five, they would have to be top 10. And I think that was one of the more shocking 
I guess, twist to this list. I mean, ESPN always seems to leave one or two teams off. And the fact that Georgia got left off of running back and offensive line, I mean, does ESPN have it out for Georgia? Man, <laughs> maybe. I'm telling you, there's there's just one intern there that, that got, like, his application de- uh, denied from Georgia for some reason. I don't know who gets denied from Georgia, but uh, apparently he did. Yeah, apparently, <laughs> apparently he, he he ended up somehow getting into Georgia Tech, but didn't get into Georgia, and his his family has it out now. But guys, we're gonna move on here to our draft coverage. Uh, you know, I know everyone's looking forward to this. I mean, the 2020 NFL Draft officially behind us, guys. I mean, it brought much needed sports content to the world. Uh, I mean, Brandon, I think we predicted this on the podcast, but um, this draft did set the record for the most viewers. I mean, the the peak was over 55 million viewers for this I, draft. I mean, there, was nothing, there was nothing else to do. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I get it. The, the last dance only comes on Sundays, so everyone was tuned in Thursday through Saturday this weekend. Um, and, you know, to say this draft was interesting or unpredictable probably is an understatement. And so now it's time for me and Brandon to go back, grade some of these, you know, draft performances here. So, Brandon, who was your biggest winner for this year's NFL draft? Oh, man, there were so many so many solid drafts or so many solid teams in this draft this year, uh, teams that I thought really pulled out, you know, huge wins despite where they may have picked. Uh, and so my biggest winner has to be Baltimore, which is just ridiculous to even think um, just about, I mean, this team was so good this past year, you know, they didn't pick, uh, you know, I think they had the 28th pick in the draft in the first round anyway. And they still had Patrick Queen fall to them. Not only that, but in the second round, they picked up J.K. Dobbins. They ended up picking up a pair of wide receivers and Devin DuVernay and James Prochet, you know, just to add to that threat that is Lamar Jackson. I mean, not only does he have Hollywood Brown now, but he has these two guys, uh, two solid guys. Um, man, it, to me, they just stood out, you know, amongst the pack. Uh, the Ravens are going to be incredible this upcoming season. Uh, and, and, you know, not to brag, but I did call the Ravens picking a running back pretty early in this draft. So that's that made me feel pretty good. And, and Justin Matabuke, let's talk about him for a second, because that was a <laughs> steal in the third round. They got him with a 71st yeah. pick. Get out of here. That, that's tough, man. I mean, I didn't see him following that far. I mean, there were some people who gave him late first, early second round grades, man. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's just. I, I honestly couldn't tell you a bad pick that they made during this draft. It's not like they took a kicker in the fifth round or anything. Uh, that, that, may be, uh, that may be foreshadowing, but they definitely didn't do that. <laughs> I know who you're going with there, but um, I guess I'll start off with a winner here. I have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some experts question this draft a little bit. I, I mean, and they call it the big one of the bigger boomer bust draft classes, but I see real value here. I don't know about you, Brandon, but let's walk through like some of the reasons I picked this team. I mean, they get Tristan Worse, which I think probably arguably is one of the best or the best offensive tackle in the draft. And they get them at 12, 13. They get them mid first round, and it feels the immediate need of O line. And I mean, protecting your inv- investment in Tom Brady should be the number one priority for this team. And I think with this pick, you had you get probably a 10, 15 year starter at tackle, and he's one of the most athletic, consistent tackles in the draft. So I mean, I think their first pick, A plus plus, is what we both said on our yes. live stream. I mean, that was a ex- that was one of the best first round picks and then in the second round Brandon one of the most underrated prospects in the draft I personally had him as I would say arguably one or two at safety in my opinion and that's Anton Winfield Jr. out of Minnesota I had a first round grade on him I think you were really high on him Uh, to get him in the second round when you already have two first, second round players playing cornerback for you. I mean, it makes the secondary pretty stout. I mean, and Winfield can play sa- either safety spot, and he can also play cornerback. He can play in the slot. I mean, that's an immediate upgrade on defense of someone who I think is going to contribute the second he gets into the facility for Tampa. And Brandon, for their mid-round picks, 
they got Tyler Johnson out of Minnesota, one of the best wide receivers in the Big Ten, and they get Keyshawn Vaughn, who I had as a top five running back in my opinion. He just got you know in a bad situation at Vanderbilt, with, but also he's smart. He ran for over a thousand yards at Vandy for multiple years, and. I view these as high risk, high reward picks, but I think both can contribute immediately. I mean, Johnson's going to be a Mitch, a mismatch in the slot, and he doesn't have to step in and be a wide receiver one. He's going to be behind Godwin, Gronkowski, Mike Evans, OJ Howard. He just needs to play his role, and I think Tyler Johnson is going to be a factor going throughout the season. And Keyshawn Vaughn, in my opinion, is going to be a huge weapon for Brady. I mean, the... Buccaneers really don't have a star running back, so I think Vaughn has a real, real shot at starting for Tampa Bay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's they had a very solid draft. It, it was hard for me not to pick them. Um, you know, as, as my best performance, I had a I had a feeling you were going to pick them though, and so I went with Baltimore. Yeah, for sure. And they did the one thing they were supposed to do, Brandon, and that is load up for a Super Bowl run these next two years. And I think they knocked their first four picks out of the park. Yeah, Tampa Bay is definitely in a win now situation, you know, with with all their offseason pickups. Um, This draft obviously isn't just going to be, hey, we have you for a year or two. It's going to be, hey, we're signing you to your rookie contract. You're here for four years at least. so they are building for the future as well as trying to win right now, which I think is one of the smartest things you could possibly do. Yeah, for sure. So, so since I made you go first, I'll go ahead and give you my loser here. And for me, no, I think well, hold it's on one second, one second, one second. Oh, go ahead. Let me let me go ahead because I have another winner. Um, okay, and I, go it's ahead. A sneaky winner. Yeah. So let me let me sneak this in here real quick. Um, my sneaky winner of this draft, Zach, you're, I don't know if you're going to agree with me here because you were pretty tough on them. Uh, I've got Miami. I honestly think the Dolphins had a very solid draft. You know, did they pick the quarterback? I think they should have uh, picked in the first round. No, not necessarily. I think Tua was, uh, kind of a long shot there. It's definitely a boomer bust, but this is a team that filled their draft with boomer busts, which I like personally. Um, Obviously, I mean, they beefed up their O-line. They went ahead and picked up Austin Jackson out of USC, that tackle. Uh, solid, solid pick at 18. I think it's a very uh, valuable pick there. Um, uh, another value pick they got was uh, in the second round, they picked up Robert Hunt from uh, UL, from Louisiana Lafayette. Lafayette. Um, he's another offensive lineman. He's a versatile player. Uh, he can play at tackle or guard. Um, not, I mean, and, and, and it just continues. I mean, they picked up another guard. Uh, and Solomon Kindley out of Georgia. And we just finished talking about this Georgia O-line and, and how solid they are. Um, they picked him up at 111, Zach. They picked him up in the fourth round. Just uh, it. The only way he gets more value than that is if we're talking about Curtis Weaver out of Boise State, an edge rusher they picked up in the fifth round with 164. Zach, I think you even talked about Curtis Weaver like a good bit on the live stream about how much of a value pick he would be later on yeah, since he wasn't picked in the first round. I think you gave you gave him like a first or second round grade. Yeah, um, he was he was a top five defensive end, in my opinion. See, and they picked him up in the fifth round. But, you know, just the cherry on top for me uh, for this Miami team was long snapper Blake Ferguson being taken, taken in the sixth round. Uh, friend of the podcast, friend of the show. Um, nothing but, but good wishes to him and his career. Uh, but that may have been their best pick overall. <laughs> I like it. I, we, yeah, we are definitely, definitely happy for Hellman. And I think the Dolphins, outside of the Tua pick, I thought they had an excellent draft. I mean, I'll question their pick about Noah Ig- 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 Igbenogany late in the first round at cornerback because Xavier Howard and Byron Jones are two of the highest paid corners in the league. And it's like, where is he going to go? I can see the slot need. So I'll let that one slide. Jackson will be a media starter offensive tackle. I wish we would have kept Tunsil, but that's a whole nother story. We saw how much he just got paid. So glad that's on their cap and not ours. I think they found real value in Kinley too. I mean, he is a monster. I thought he could easily be a second round pick there. I think they did everything they were supposed to in this draft. And as a Dolphins fan, I'm very, very proud of this draft. I mean, yeah. uh, it, it's real refreshing to not see the Dolphins screw up a draft for the first time since I've probably been alive. And <laughs> let me let me ask you about uh, their seventh round pick, Malcolm Perry. Obviously, the quarterback from uh, Navy. He's going to play Love wide it. receiver in the league. I, I like it too. I like it a lot. And and I wasn't sure how you felt about it. He's he's like Antonio Gibson. 
it, 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 but he's from the Naval Academy, which equips him with all these other qualities that you just want to find an NFL player. I don't see how he busts, and I can see him down the road being one of those picks where it's like, how did we let him get to the seventh round? I, that was one of my favorite picks. I was, I'm glad you brought that one up. That one slipped my mind. But when they drafted Perry with their last pick, I was like, that is that is just a cherry on top of a. Excellent draft for to, for the Dolphins, and um, it was very very refreshing to see. I, I'm going to tell you, I mean, it, for years and years we've just seen the Dolphins waste picks on just players that have not developed, or if they do develop, they just trade them. So let's hope the Dolphins keep these players around. But I think the change in culture that the Dolphins are going through under Brian Flores is just amazing. And you know, since you gave your surprise winner. I'll give my surprise one now. I was going to wait till the end, but I'll go ahead and give it. I don't know if you even thought about this team, Brandon, but I have the Denver Broncos here uh, as yep. my as my low key winner. I guess you could classify them as. I mean, this class again has some bust potential, but I think the value on some of these players are way higher than some experts are are giving them. And I think the Broncos are building something really, really special in Denver. Um, You know, we talked on the live stream. The fact that Jerry Judy winds up at 15 for the Broncos is outrageous, if you ask me. I mean, 15, when he was probably, Brandon, what would you say, a top 10 player in the draft? Top five? And that's that's not even a debate. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, top five. And then with their second round pick, they get another player who I had in my top five wide receivers, KJ Hamler out of Penn State, perfect in the slot. So you have Cortland Sutton out in the outside, Judy outside, and then you have KJ Hamler in the slot. I mean, it, Drew Locke has no excuse anymore. I mean, that wide receiving core, and for me, can compete with almost anyone in the country. Right. And Brady, you'll love this pick. In their in the I believe it was the third fourth round it was it was this weekend they picked up Lloyd Cushenberry the third and I think he has the potential to fill in an immediate need on the inside of that offensive line and so when you when your first three picks hit like this I think I think you have to be a winner here and for the Denver Broncos they have a lot of needs don't get me wrong but. I think they hit. And then for tight end, they get Drew Locke's ex-teammate out of Missouri. I mean, I th- I, for me, I think the Broncos killed their draft. I wish they would have got a tackle. But I, I think Cushenberry fills an immediate need on the inside, and tackle can come at a later time. Right, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so I'll go ahead, give my uh, give, give a loser here. I, I have a real loser and one that I think people just kind of gave the benefit of the doubt to. And my number one loser, I feel like me and Brandon might have the same team here because there is one obvious loser in my opinion, and that's and that, and that's the Green Bay Packers. Uh, yep, 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 yep. I, I have the Green Bay Packers here at my as my first loser, and here's why, guys. Okay. Let me explain. I hope Brandon Brandon might have another take on this, but when the draft officially ends and you're looking at your board of needs and your biggest need was not addressed and you had nine picks in seven rounds, then you're a loser in my opinion. You couldn't get one player that addressed your biggest need. Not one. Not, man. The, 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 there was tough. no wide receivers taken by this team, and wide receiver was the obvious need. There were people saying, I mean, the Raiders drafted four wide receivers, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I thought they were a winner. They gave they gave targets to Lamar Jackson. Yeah, it's like just outrageous. I mean, and but, but Zach, Zach, some people would argue they got Josiah DeGuara out of Cincinnati at tight end. <laughs> that was what a terrible pick, by the way. Let me let me say that. Josiah DeGuara, you know who was still on the board at that point? Thaddeus Moss. He went undrafted, but you went with Josiah DeGuara? Are you kidding me? There were so many other tight ends on the board as well. It's just that I also had the Packers as my biggest loser in this draft, and so I'm going to chime in a little bit here. Uh, I'm heated. I'm heated. Guys, okay, so let me say this. I don't love the Jordan Love pick. Sorry for the play on words there. I hate the Jordan Love pick. But let me just say this. The reason I hate it is not because of Jordan Love himself. 
he has potential. Favre came in kind of iffy with interceptions and his decision making. We know they can work with that. But why did you trade up? There was no reason to trade up. And we talked about this a little bit on the live stream. But in case you didn't tune in, I'm going to play it out for you. I understand you needed Rodgers' replacement. I think Brandon agrees with that. I'll agree with that. Uh, most people will say, okay, I got you. But Brandon, he would have been there at 30. Okay, so I'm going to run through the teams that they traded you know, in front of. So they traded in front of the Dolphins. Were the Dolphins going to pick a second first-round quarterback after drafted to a tag of Aloha? There was no, no. chance. No. Not a single it, chance. They, they drafted in front of the Seahawks. I think Russell Wilson's fine where he is. I, I don't think they need a big backup. Like, Russell Wilson still has some time in this league. And then they drafted in front of the Ravens. I, I think the Ravens are good, guys. They have RG3 and Lamar Jackson. That they're, they're good. They were not going quarterback with their pick. And then the Titans. Yes, given that's maybe the only team I could have seen, but I think the Titans have made it very clear they're sticking with Tannehill, and they had bigger needs outside of that. And then, then you get to pick 30, and that would have been them. So why did you trade up for you know, Jordan Love here? I don't... I don't see the reason why you would give up capital for a move that didn't have to be made. For me, it looked like an impulsive, panicky move by the Packers. And for an organization that's been so successful long term, I don't I don't completely understand why you make that move there. It it just doesn't make a lot of sense whatsoever. I, I mean oh, man, it, it really I was baffled by the Packers, uh, by the Packers draft this year. It just, it seemed for a lack of a better word, awful. And, and and I'm stuck on this tight end pick. I understand you don't like Jordan love. Um, I kind of called that one. I, I, you know, this is kind of what the Packers like to do. Do I think it was a good pick? Not necessarily. I think they probably could have gotten another quarterback that was more similar uh, to Aaron Rodgers down the road a little bit, but I don't know. It, It just, to me, didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, there were just so many other needs for the Packers in this draft, and they went with Jordan Love first overall. Not only that, but they went with A.J. Dillon as the running back in the second round. Uh, I don't know. It, it, just, it, it doesn't seem – I know people were outraged by those first two picks, so that's really what I wanted to outline. A.J. Dillon just I, – I don't know if he's the answer to the problems. He's he's not. You want to know why he's not? Because the backup running back was still NFL's leading rusher last year in Aaron Jones, and his backup was Jamal Williams, a veteran that's that's been in the NFL for many years. It's like you're going to draft a third string running back with your second pick. <laughs> no, I guess not. Oh, that's so bad. I mean, I I don't I I don't understand why you go with that pick there. I mean. Uh, I literally can't put my finger on it. Can you? I mean, why are you going? I mean, it, you look at running backs that were available later on, like Keyshawn Vaughn and Zach Moss out of Utah. I mean, you had better options outside of an injury-prone guy from Boston College. I just And with wide receivers, you had Antonio Gibson still on the board. If you wanted to go offensive line, you had Josh Jones. If you wanted to go defense again, Zach Braun. I mean... Lynn Bowden Jr., Brian Edwards. I mean, the list goes on and on about the talent that you just left on the board there. And I don't think you can overlook that when grading the Packers draft. I mean, and then you're you're saying, okay, well, that's only a few picks. I mean, they must have done something better with their other picks. They literally don't have a pick that jumps off the page to me. I mean, if I've read off the names, which I'm not going to bore you all reading off all their names, I promise you not a single listener would know who it was. No, they they wouldn't. Um, I, I don't want to harp too much more on the Packers. I think people understand how bad their draft was, um, but it definitely had to be addressed at least on the surface level. Yeah, it it did. And you know, for my like, I guess surprise loser, um, I'm gonna have to go the Las Vegas Raiders here. Uh, okay. You know, and the reason is I think. When you have multiple first round picks, you have to hit on one of them, right? At least one of them has to work out. And they reached on both of their picks. I mean, their second pick at, you know, number 19, they reached for a third round graded cornerback. 
yeah, yeah, it's it, it's tough. What, what? Why did you go? What? Why did you? Why would you reach that far when you also had three third round picks already? Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's what the Ouija board that they communicate with Al Davis told them to do, or something. It, it was just what 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 terrible picks though. That, right, and then you reach at 12 for Henry Ruggs over Jerry Judy, C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, and Ruggs wasn't even the best wide receiver on his own team his whole career in Alabama. And you took him at 12? I don't even know if he was the third best receiver on his own team. That's what I'm saying. And then, not only that, so you reach for the wide receiver. Okay, he's your guy. You take two more wide receivers? They have to have targets for Marcus Mariota slash Derek Carr, slash whoever else they have now. Maybe I Cam Newton. I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe but, Cam Newton. And, and I don't hate the Lynn Bowden Jr. or Brian Edwards picked. I think uh, Brian Edwards was in my top five wide receivers too, I believe. And Bowden Jr. has a huge upside, can play multiple positions, could go to defense. But your second biggest need was outside linebacker, and you didn't take a single linebacker. Yeah, you, you took three secondary players. The rest were wide receivers and one O-lineman. See, the reason I didn't want to pick on the Raiders too much is because this is exactly what I expected out of the Raiders. And I did want to talk about the Packers because who expected this these kind of moves out of the Packers? Packers are a great franchise. Raiders, meh. It, you figure they learned their lesson every year. They go, they go after the fastest straight line speed wide receiver. How how many times do you, do you have to be shown that that doesn't work? I guess at least one more. I, I don't know. It, it's bad. I mean, we had a whole segment about how the forty yard dash doesn't matter, and that there's only one wide receiver in the Hall of Fame that's run under like a four three, and it's Randy Moss, which was a freak of nature. And you just keep reaching for fast wide receivers. That's it might matter in Madden leagues. Yes, that's great to have a 99 overall speed player. But guess what? In real life, it does not matter. I'd rather have a four. What was it? A four seven out of Jerry Rice than a four two. Um, you know Henry Ruggs. I mean, come on, guys. It, it's like it's like what was that SpongeBob thing where it's like how many times we got to keep keep teaching you this lesson, old man? I mean, it is just <laughs> outrageous. Zach, did you see the video? Um, I think it was on like Bleacher Report or something of the kid running the four one seven forty yard dash, just out. I don't know where he was, but he ran a four one seven. That's uh, out, dude, that doesn't even, I, that's, that doesn't even seem like that should be real. I am shocked the Raiders didn't take him. Is where I'm going with this. Uh, the, <laughs> he's actually probably their first round pick next year. They've already signed him as an undrafted free agent. Um, you say Bolt, Usain Bolt's upset that he's old, older, too old to play in the NFL, really? Because the Raiders would be picking them, picking him every year with their first round pick if they could. I guess so. Uh, I'm gonna go. We're gonna go ahead and move on a little bit um, with my sneaky pick, which is also just kind of a transition to the next segment. Um, uh, another another team that I I think uh, could be considered a loser in this draft. Well, really, every team. Um, because that's every team who didn't draft uh, Anthony Gordon. How did you not draft Anthony Gordon in this draft? And, and that's, like I said, Zach, go ahead and introduce, introduce us to the next storyline because I have a lot to say. Or to the next uh, segment because I have a ton to say. Yeah, guys. So we want to continue this draft coverage. Yeah, we're college football podcast, but this is in the news. This involves college players. Um, so we're going to address some of the biggest storylines in the NFL draft. So we're going to go with Brandon's question here about how did Anthony Gordon not get drafted, but someone who, um, you know, this will play into one of my questions I have for Brandon. So we'll combine them is how did Anthony Gordon not get drafted, but then the saints traded up in the seventh round to get a quarterback, Tommy Stevens out of Mississippi State, who got benched for a true freshman this year. Oh, oh you're going to make me talk about it? Oh, yeah. No, we, we're going to get this out. This is a therapy session for Brandon. Okay. I wasn't I wasn't expecting this, but I guess we can do it. Um, oh, okay, let's talk about it. Anthony Gordon didn't get drafted. Uh, maybe a good thing for him. You know, of course, the kid wants to get paid. Um, I've already expressed this several times. He's definitely in my top five quarterbacks in this draft class, and he just wasn't drafted, period. He signed with the 49ers. 
Uh, so I guess the 49ers are not as big of a loser as anybody else, but they're still kind of a loser in my opinion. Um, this kid has a huge arm, a huge arm. And if you put him behind the right quarterback, he's going to develop this. Listen, if the Packers were to draft any quarterback, which I don't think they need a quarterback right now necessarily, um, this might have been the guy. You want a guy. You want a guy with a big arm in Green Bay. Uh, well, if you have wide receivers to pass to, that is. I guess you don't. So you really just messed up in in every single facet of this draft. Uh, but uh, good God, there there were so many quarterbacks in this draft, and so many that were taken. James Morgan was drafted in the fourth round of this of this draft. You are telling me that James Morgan is better than Anthony Gordon? No, and Jake no Fromm. Way. And Jake Fromm. <laughs> Yeah, Jake Fromm slipped to the fifth round. That's that's neither here nor there. Jalen Hurts got drafted in the second round of this draft. Hey, hang on. Just leave that there. That's coming up next. That's coming up next. That's, okay. that's going to be its own question. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and talk about let's go ahead and talk about the Saints because I'm pissed. Everyone knows that I'm mad about Anthony Gordon. I can't even get the words out of my mouth. So so what, what do you want to talk about, Zach? You want to talk about Tommy Stevens? Yeah, let's get let's talk about Tommy Stevens, Brandon. Let's do it. Let's go. Uh, Brandon. Well, is he – so the Saints have come out and said that he's going to see the field. Where, when does Tommy Stevens see the field for you this season for the Saints? The same time that – whenever Taysom Hill gets tired because he's the same guy, they're the same player. And everyone knows how – actually, I don't know if everyone knows how I feel about Taysom Hill because this is an NFL podcast. Everyone I know personally knows how I feel about Taysom Hill. He's not the future. He's not even – listen, he's not a great NFL player. People like to act like he's – Saints fans love him. I'm a Saints fan. Don't love him. Shock. That's a shock to everybody. Uh, Tommy Stevens is just Taysom Hill Jr., and that's exactly what Sean Payton was trying to do when he picked him. He's like, ah, oh, Taysom Hill, he's 30 years old. He's he's kind of getting up there in age, you know, which I, I guess didn't really deter him from signing Taysom Hill to another two-year contract today whenever we're recording. He got he got extended through 2021, which is a whole different rant. But Tommy Stevens, you have got to be kidding me. Anthony Gordon just wasn't drafted, period. But but the Saints want to go with with Tommy Stevens. Who even is that? I understand. And Zach said he got benched for a true freshman. Yeah, he also kind of just got hurt during the middle of the season. Um, this might be a quarterback who has more injury problems than Tua, if that's possible. It's, it's just a terrible pick. Do, do you want me to make you feel bad, Brandon? No, dude, I already feel bad. Can't you tell? So, so you know, you keep saying this is like a Tyson Hill pick, right? Yeah. Uh, Ty, Tyson Hill in college ran for almost 3,000 yards over his – apparently he played like six years in college for some reason. He ran for almost 3,000 yards, right? Yeah. Do you know how many rushing yards Tommy Stevens had his whole career? It's like twelve hundred, I'm guessing. Eight hundred. Eight hundred. That's so bad. He, oh his, man, his, that's his, bad. his top year was this year when he had three three eighty one. Tyson Tyson Hill ran Wait, the please, ball. Please, please, I'm gonna go ahead and correct you, Zach. I hate to correct you. Taysom Hill. It's not there's there's an A in there. Okay, Taysom Hill. <laughs> my bad. There we go. Um ran the ball five hundred and thirty four times in his career. Um, right. Yeah, Tommy Stevens only had 150 carries his entire career. I man, and we just we just got off another rant about how the 40 yard dash doesn't matter. But every Saints fan in the world who loves Taysom Hill for some reason decides they want to love Tommy Stevens suddenly, and the first thing they want to point to is, oh, he ran a 449 40 yard dash. Who cares? When in the world in the Saints offense are you going to take off? and run down the field as a quarterback, you're not. That's not the kind of offense that's run there. Uh, I'm going to make you feel even worse here. Are you ready for this? No. Tommy, Tommy Stevens has, out of his five years in college, only threw over 30 passes once. Yeah, it's it's awful. He threw for 1,400 yards in his career, Brandon, through five years. Uh, it, why? Why, 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 oh, why it, Tommy Stevens? T- t- the Saints t- didn't even have a the Saints didn't t- even have a seventh round pick. They they traded into the draft for this. What? Uh, it, to, to give y'all guys a comparison, Taysom Hill had almost seven thousand passing yards in his career. I hate this. This is the worst. 
this was the worst day ever yeah, uh, on Saturday when, when the Saints drafted Tommy Stevens. I texted Zach immediately. I was and, so mad. And, and then to make it worse, y'all, y'all are going to sign Jameis Winston as well? Zach, that was – I woke up to a text this morning that just said Jameis Winston question mark. And I was like, what do you mean Jameis Winston? So I went to Twitter – look up Jameis Winston and see that the Saints signed him to a one-year deal. So now the Saints just have Drew Brees, who is a Hall of Fame quarterback, and he's backed up by Taysom Hill and Tommy Stevens and I guess Jameis Squinston. This is the worst. Hey, he got eye surgery. He he got eye surgery, bro. It is rolling now. I don't know, man. What what if he's good now? Who knows? Uh, He's not. Uh, Who am I kidding? He's not. (laughs) So I, I have a theory. I have a theory. I think the Saints are kind of taking the same route as Denver took after uh, – <laughs> uh, oh, man. Uh, I don't even know what I'm trying to say right now. I'm, I'm, I'm jumbled up. Um, the Saints are trying to uh, take the same approach as Denver um, in that when their Hall of Fame quarterback retires, they're just not going to get any other quarterback ever. Like they don't want to, they don't want to put Drew Brees in the shadows. So they're just gonna, they're gonna sign Jameis Winston and Tommy Stevens to to run the franchise. I guess. You telling me you don't want Brock Osweiler like the Broncos decided to do? No, that's what. Or Are Joe you kidding Flacco? me? No, Joe, get out of here! Out out of here! I hate this. <laughs> so to give Brandon a break, we're gonna move here. Um, so another huge storyline, probably the biggest one of the weekend, I would say, is the Eagles deciding to draft Jalen Hurts in the second round to I don't know whether to replace or ultimately back up quarterback Carson Wentz in Philadelphia. Brandon, what are your impressions of this move? What did you think about it? Why make this decision now? Uh, I, I think the Eagles needed another wide receiver, and so they saw the versatility in Jalen Hurts. That's that's my take. They needed wide receivers. Everyone knows it. Jalen Hurts. Here we go. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Man, uh, so I don't – one, I don't know why Jalen Hurts went fourth as a quarterback. Uh, two, the second round – I don't but, know, man. It, Listen, it, it. I understand. I, I know the Eagles. A lot of people said they don't need a quarterback. I'm obviously joking when I say that Jalen Hurts is a wide receiver. Um, but I started thinking about it, and maybe they should have drafted a better quarterback. But Carson Wentz is hurt a lot, right, Zach? So maybe they did need another quarterback. I, I, I guess. I, okay, I get the quarterback pick, but not in the second round. No, and especially when players like I mean, I'm not I'm not going to sit here and talk about how good Jake Fromm is, but he he dropped to the fifth round. Anthony yeah. Gordon wasn't drafted. A- Anthony Gordon, Jake Fromm, Jacob Eason, apparently the kid out of FIU that someone decided to like. All those players were on the board. Tommy Stevens, if you want to go there, I mean, there were so no many more quarterbacks there. on the board. Yeah, it's you had, you had Lynn Bowden Jr. who could have played both wide receiver and quarterback if we want to go there. Yeah, that's true. Probably listen, and and we know what Jalen Hurts was capable of in college. You know, he had a he had a solid film for most of his college career, but he is not built to be an NFL quarterback. And I'm the first. I'll be the first to say. And we've said it for months. You know, it's not like this is a new take from us. This is this has been said. I mean, literally for months. Yeah, and I've had Alabama fans come ask me what I thought about the pick, and they and they were saying they're going to be Eagles fans from day one, and Jalen Hurts is leading Philadelphia to the promised land. Like, I just want to make you guys understand, if Carson Wentz is healthy, it's a wrap. Jalen Hurts will not see the field unless it's in a wide receiver capacity. No, and I can't wait for a few years when the Saints decide, you know what, we need to sign uh, Jalen Hurts because it, it's it's just bound to happen now, right? This has Apparently, to uh, if yeah. y'all are going to go into quarterback limbo, I feel like he has to be on the list, right? Yeah, he's he's on the short list. I don't know how long his rookie contract is, but in the next three, four seasons, I, you know, Jalen Hurts can be wearing black and gold. It's not even a debate. So, you know, speaking about quarterback, uh, what, we got two more, you know, storylines here. Uh, um, you know, what do you make of the Patriots taking no quarterbacks? 
no running backs and no wide receivers in this draft. There you go. Um, that was one of mine. So I've only got one more after this. Uh, but it, it's ridiculous. It, I don't understand. Obviously, your biggest need here, if you're the Patriots, has to be quarterback. Tom Brady is gone. And like I said, you know, I said this on the live on the live stream. I think I've said it on previous episodes. Uh, Jared Stidham is spoken very high, highly of in New England, um, and that might he might be the guy now. Uh, obviously, Brian Hoyer still has a chance to start, and Jared Stidham can sit behind him uh, and learn a little bit. But uh, I, yeah, I I don't think it's smart. I think the I think the Patriots should have drafted a quarterback at least, you know. And they did sign Jamar Smith from Louisiana Tech as an undrafted free agent, uh, but still not Anthony Gordon. I don't understand that for the life of me. Also, they drafted the kicker in the fifth round. What's going on there? I hate kickers. They're not even real football players, even though they put the foot in football. Uh, They're not real. I mean, how do you pick a kicker but not a quarterback? I'm baffled. This is bonkers. (laughs) Now watch they're gonna turn the quarterback they're gonna turn the kicker into a quarterback. It's gonna be all the rap for Bill Belichick. I mean, it could be that his dog was drafting for him at one point and the dog just like hit the button for the kicker and Belichick was like, Well, I guess we got the kicker now. Out of Marshall guess, too. Uh, he's a good kicker. Let's not let's not he's a very good kicker. Um, but did he deserve to be drafted in the fifth round? Absolutely not. So, you know, before you get to your last one, man, I got one question to ask you about this, and I think it's going to make you a little bit happier here. Um, LSU tied the NCAA record for most players drafted in one draft with 14. They beat, they shattered Alabama's record um, for SEC, you know, the SEC record here. So the, what does this say about what Coach Ed Orgeron is doing, and does this, in your mind, I know you're already really high on this team, did this solidify them as – the best NCAA team ever or one of the best? Yeah, I, I think it did. It, you know, if not the best, then definitely one of the best. Um, and I think what it says about Coach O is that he is building just a, a, a great culture in Baton Rouge uh, at, at Louisiana State University. Um, you know, to, to have 14 players drafted, not only that, but right now, as we're recording, they're hovering right around 20 players that are on NFL rosters from this from this. Uh, past year's team that's unheard of so the uh, i mean there's 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 11 starters um they had their backup tight end drafted that's just that's how good they are how and how mad are you that the fact that thaddeus moss didn't get drafted cost you guys the sole holder of the record uh i'm i'm very mad uh, i'll <laughs> i'll be the first one to say that Braden fayoko wasn't drafted either um neither was michael divinity uh, there were a couple question marks there. I, you know, you, you you kept asking me how Thad Moss wasn't drafted, and you know, I found myself asking the same question. I think the answer lies in that he's had three foot surgeries over his college career, and most recently he had one this off season. Uh, I'm not sure that a team wanted to take a risk on that right now. You know, the Redskins obviously signed him now, so he's in Washington, uh, D.C. That is. Uh, and I think that he'll be a solid, a solid tight end there. You know, if if Dwayne Haskins can get a pass off. Yeah, fair enough. Because they did trade, you know, Trent Williams for some odd reason. But yeah, Brady, you can go ahead and move to your last question here, man. Um, yeah, yeah. My last, uh, my last point that I wanted to make for storylines um, had to be, you know, it might have been one of my favorite moments uh, this weekend, as far as the draft is concerned. Um, and that's Jacob Eason when he was taken in the fourth round. Uh, he was he was interviewed afterward, and he was quoted as saying that after this virus calms down, I'm going to go out there and compete my nuts off. So I don't I don't know what that means exactly, but I know that it got got me fired up. So I don't even know if that's a storyline. I just felt like I had to mention it. That's a legendary quote after you get drafted. If you ask me, so he compete his nuts off. I, I like it. Yeah, you know, he's if going it, to Indianapolis, <laughs> I guess. I mean, they they kind of need a quarterback, right? Well, they have Philip Rivers. They're going to need one in the yeah, future. for a but, year. Uh, yeah, fair. I, I think he's going to be gone pretty soon. But, guys, going to move to our last segment here um, of this packed episode. Uh, you know, every year players are forced to make one of the most important decisions of their life when they decide to either return to school for another year or imp- and improve their draft stock or they choose to take a chance in the NFL draft. For players such as Tua Tagovailoa, Justin Jefferson – uh, you know, this decision is 
pretty simple. I mean, but other players, the decision might not be as clear. It could be the difference in being drafted, being signed as an undrafted free agent, or not even getting a shot at all. So, Brandon, you know, is there a player or players that you think probably could have benefited from one more season in college? Uh, okay, so I mentioned this to Zach before we even started today's episode. This segment, for whatever reason, stumped me. And so I only have one player here. And it's a player that we've talked about in the past uh, as as maybe they should have stayed in college football for another year. Uh, and that's Jake Fromm. Jake Fromm dropped all the way to the fifth round in this draft. And once they got to the fifth round, he got drafted by the Buffalo Bills. Um, that's the Bills, the same Bills that have Josh Allen, who now that Tom Brady's out of the AFC East, might be the best quarterback in the AFC East. So I don't see him getting any significant playing time as as well, not, not realistically to start anyway. Um, He may end up, you know, you know, once, once he has a couple years, I think that he really could have benefited by staying at Georgia for one more season. I understand his entire O-line was just leaving. And so that might've pushed him out, but uh, I think maybe coming back to Georgia to prove himself, especially after this past season where he was just, I'll go ahead and say not himself. I guess that's the nicest way I can put it. I agree. I, I think he definitely could have came back. I mean, because you get you get George Pickens, another crop of five star, four star offensive linemen. You get to play it. I mean, yeah, next season he might not be the number one QB in the class, but I don't think many people are going to be above Trevor Lawrence if you ask me or Justin Fields. So no, and, and next year, I mean, you have Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, but I mean, what I mean. You you have to talk. You have to start talking about Jake Fromm in that top five group of quarterbacks at that point, right? Uh, you know, this year obviously not, but but next year I think that he's in the top five quarterbacks uh, in the draft class. You know, if he stays and if he has another season like he did his freshman or sophomore year. Yeah, I completely agree there, and I I I I think him and the person I'm about to bring up were two of the most confusing ones, since because I feel like they're not breakaway easy first round picks. I mean, the film is kind of there, the inconsistencies there. They're not, you know, the most physical, like appealing QBs. It's just I don't understand why you would come out at this point. I mean, I don't think anyone had Eason or Eason or from going first round, right? No, no, not at all. No. And so that leaves me, I picked Jacob Eason as one of mine as well. I mean, he fell all the way to the fourth round. And, you know, for a five-star quarterback coming into Georgia, it's supposed to be the chosen one. To have to transfer closer to your hometown and then you fall all the way to a fourth-round pick is not, I don't think that's the path he wanted to choose there. And I, why would you not come back to Washington? You get an upstart head coach, a lot of the teams returning, I mean, I I don't understand why you wouldn't want to come back one more year, right? I mean, you can only improve. He had one year in that system, and your first year in the system is always the weakest. So you come back, you know the playbook, you know the culture, you know the players, the head coaches from within the system. I I can't wrap my mind around why Jacob Eason thought it would be a good idea to come out this year. You know – I agree with you a million percent, Zach. And the reason I didn't have Jacob Eason on here is because I feel like he's been in college for like six years now. And so I, I probably could have done more research. Uh, didn't realize he was a junior. So that's that's yeah, why I he, didn't have him in mind. Yeah, he's a red shirt junior. He had a ex, another year of eligibility due to his red shirt after he transferred. I, I really just don't understand. I mean, that offense had a lot of young talent coming back. The recruiting class was there. And outside of really Oregon, who in the Pac-12 was going to compete, Utah lost a lot of talent. And outside of Oregon, it was going to come down to you and them. So why not come back and win you a Pac-12 title, maybe a Rose Bowl, and only improve your stock. Yeah, I, I agree with you a million percent. Like I said, um, I I really don't have anything else to say though. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he definitely could have benefited from another year uh, at Washington. Maybe because uh, Washington's coach retired this past season, he didn't want to go back to a new head coach. I don't know though. Yeah, but they hired from inside the program, so it just I was like, you know, the person, right? I mean, maybe maybe I, they had beef. Yeah, maybe. But another player fell to the fifth round is uh, Quintez Cephas out of Wisconsin. I thought, you know, he uh, why not come back a 
one more year. I mean, Wisconsin, uh, they're returning the same quarterback. I get it. But I only saw upside with him. I mean, I think the team's still going to be strong. The offensive line's there. The talent's there. The notoriety, the playing, you know, in front of large crowds on TV all the time's there. Why not come back if you didn't get the grade you wanted? I mean, I think Cephas has the has the potential to be a first, second round talent, but the quick jump had him dropping all the way to the fifth round. Yeah, is that and the one thing that comes into that comes to mind here is exactly what you just said. They have the same quarterback returning. They have Jack Cohn returning uh, to Wisconsin, and I mean, he and his sixty two percent completion rate are going to be passing to Quintez Stevens again this season. Uh, he might not have wanted – I mean, I understand that he has the talent to be first, second round uh, in the draft, but if he if, if the ball isn't anywhere near him, then how can he prove that? You know, And this – I understand that I'm using this at, to my advantage right here uh, just to promote Graham Mertz for quarterback for Wisconsin, and I'm fine with that. Graham Mertz for quarterback for Wisconsin this upcoming season, then maybe uh, he would have decided to come back. Yeah, I, I I get that, but I I really think even though Graham Mertz could have won the job, maybe or you know Jack Cohen takes a big step in development. I just thought Cephas didn't really gain a whole lot by coming out. And my last one, Brandon, you probably have a lot to say on this is Thaddeus Moss. I mean, okay, your backup, the backup tight end, the guy who you set the bench behind you got drafted, but you didn't, and. I don't know what what kind of evaluation he got from the draft board or whatever, but I I don't think it was ever above a fourth round pick. Why wouldn't you come back? The only thing I can think of here uh, would be the the surgeries. Honestly, you know he, he runs a risk by going to the draft this year. Obviously, he didn't get drafted, but he did get signed. Um, you know, if he comes back, he has to have a fourth foot surgery. You know, while he's in college then does he even have a chance to sign with a team? I, you know, I don't know. Or does he have a chance to legitimately make a roster? Because, you know, it, it, he did get signed by the Redskins. I think that he'll probably have a chance to make this roster, the 52-man 52, uh, 52 roster. Um, but, you know, it, it, if he goes back to LSU, hurts his foot again, has another surgery, you know, he may end up being practice squad, off-season member of a team. And he might never make an NFL debut. I get that to a point, but I mean, he already is an undrafted free agent. And I guess he knows more about himself than I do, but I didn't see someone like him needing to make a jump real quick, jump this fast. I mean, if you have as much, you know, I guess, how Miles Brennan is looking in practice, there's a chance JT Daniels could come to LSU. I mean, I think he had everything to gain. I mean, he's got, I feel like he, he would get the benefit of the doubt, even if he came back and didn't perform super well because of his dad. And so right. I just feel like he could only go up. I mean, and the looking hindsight's always 2020. I get that, but you can't get much worse than an undrafted free agent, right? Uh, you, 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 well, you can get a lot worse than an undrafted free agent that signs with a team. That's for sure. You can just go undrafted and not sign. That's fair enough. I don't think that would have ever happened to him. Do you? I'm telling you, with that foot injury, I mean, that's the reason he didn't get drafted. And and if he goes out and gets hurt again, and it, you know, it might be even be debilitating. You know, he might be told by a doctor that he can't play again. And do you really want to run that risk? Yeah, I I, I got you there. I got you there. I I just I felt so. I, it was so confusing until you know this information came out because I was sitting there watching the draft and. Tight end after tight end after tight end, and then the backup tight end goes from LSU. I mean, for someone who might not have known about the injuries, that had to just be so confusing. Because I was sitting there, I was like, their backup tight end got drafted. That doesn't even make any sense. I mean, how many snaps did the backup tight end actually play for LSU this year? Uh, not a lot. You know, the only time I, you know, the only time I can truly remember him playing, um, besides you know playing in the fourth quarter when LSU had a good lead. Uh, was in the Senior Bowl. You know, I, I did get to see him in the Senior Bowl this season. And, um, you know, he, he really did show out there. And I think the reason he got drafted is because he can also play wide receiver. Uh, he's fast enough for that. And, and I don't know. You know, I, I guess that's why. But I, I get I get the point you're trying to make here. 
Yeah, guys. But so let us know who you guys think should have came back for one more year, what you guys thought about the draft in general. But for right, for right now, that's a wrap on this episode. Shout out to you guys for tuning in. Again, I mean, me and Brandon cannot thank y'all enough for everyone who tuned in to our draft special. It uh, put, put a lot of work into getting that together for you guys. Appreciate everyone who came and asked questions, shared it, got everyone to listen. We had a huge turnout. So shout out to you guys for that one. I know um, they probably, I can't imagine all tuning in for four and a half hours, but if you want to go check out a certain pick, what we thought at the time, it is up on our YouTube channel, the blue bloods search it. It is up there. You can find the entire draft special we aired. Um, find old episodes you want to listen to interviews etc you can find the podcast anywhere guys um apple podcast google podcast spotify wherever and social media instagram at the underscore blue bloods facebook at the blue bloods pod um twitter at the underscore underscore blue bloods uh yeah follow us like subscribe everywhere rate the podcast where you can tell your friends family Whatever you, whoever you want to tell, whoever you know would come listen, let us know. Just let them know. But for right now, guys, we out. 